Creative Vitality Jam Sessions. Here we have intimate conversations with extraordinary dance and theater artists about reimagining creativity and supporting and building community. Creative Vitality Jam Sessions and I walk in solidarity as allies for equality, justice, and respect because Black Lives Matter and we will keep walking the walk in order for change to come. I'm Helen Pickett, and today's guest is Michael Stromile. He is an artist, a company artist with Boston Ballet. Michael and I have known each other since 2016. There he is. So Michael, I would like to know, uh, we have a lot to get into, and I would like to know where you are in the world. Uh, well, I'm finally back in Massachusetts. I had been in Texas visiting family for a few weeks. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm back here uh, doing some, some work and trying to just navigate the pandemic still at this point. Yeah, exactly. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the sofa that we created your solo on? It is. This is a this is a very uh, multifunctional sofa. Um, it's for dance purposes. It's for life purposes. Uh, yes, this is this is the the sofa that we did home studies on. Hey, and 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 I remember when you lost a screw out of the bottom of it and it started. Getting I still <laughs> haven't put that screw back in. I don't know where it's supposed to go. It's like, and I don't. I think I've lost the screw at this point. But yeah, so one day I'm telling you this couch is going to collapse. I just like, kind of like this. It's going to be a blue time. Like, yeah, I'm like, that's what it's gonna become because I'm just like really walking on faith here because at any moment it could just it could be it. <laughs> <laughs> so my call, let's dive right in. Um I want to start with the three choreographic honors. So I'm going back a little bit. The three choreographic honors you got from Juilliard in 2018, I believe. The Hector, is this how you say the name? Zaraski? Yes. Yes, prize for choreography. So within those prizes that you got in Juilliard in 2018, choreography seems to be one of your futures, because I think there will be many. <laughs> um, what draws you to choreography? Um, you maybe know, I mention, always maybe mention what you're you're actually getting start starting to work on something now. Right? Yeah, I am, yeah. and I think what has always what I'm realizing as an adult what draws me to choreography um, is the the fact that it takes me back to my childhood in a sense that choreography for me is this world of imagination, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's putting together these different ideas and thoughts that can sometimes seem abstract or, or out of my range. Um, and then I start to, as I start creating, I start to realize that, okay, this actually isn't that abstract. Like it actually is coming from somewhere from information that's already inside of me, yeah. but it still leaves the door open for um, trying new things. And I think that I'm, I've always been drawn to trying new things. Yeah, I mean, in the work that we did together. Um, so when I say I know that sofa, everyone, um, my call was uh, part of the original home studies. So the first part of the triptych. Um, and he invited me into his home because that's the only way we could do this choreography. So um, I think that the, how you're drawn to well basically it's curiosity yes yeah absolutely yeah. it is <laughs> it's yeah. a way it's a way for me to work out those those questions that i because i ask a lot of questions of life yeah. in general and so it's kind of a way for me to navigate that and we i know we both share a love for reading and for and for books and yeah. one of the other things um Maybe it's because I haven't seen you since we filmed this, but one of the other things I loved what my call did is he brought some dinner table art books <laughs> from his home that became part of his set in the solo. So he bought a part of his home 
to the set, as did Leah. She brought that ruckable. Yeah, yeah, so she did. Yeah, yeah, I loved that. <laughs> so, um, so, okay, so when we worked on, you know, recently on home studies, on your solo, we had a collaborative space, even with the Zoom, that when both of us started out, we were like, oh man, you know, it's, it's so different than the studio. We don't have contact. It's, it's very whatever. It's very right. distant. But it ended up feeling very intimate in another way. So did this new Zoom experience shift your idea of, cre of creating? Yeah, I think it, it actually made me realize that what we know as dance or what we know as ballet or art mm. uh, is actually only defined by the ways in which we define it. Um, so if that, if that is true, then that means that we can also shift that paradigm. And it made me realize that the art that we make in the studio or the, the impact that art has in the studio, it has that same impact in my home. Um, and I, it, that, that was actually a really great revelation for me because I don't normally ever dance in my apartment or, you know, do anything. Like if I'm, usually if I'm going to do something, I go to the studio and like, that's usually a space reserved for, you know, creating and, and working out physically. But there was something special, I think, about bringing it into a space that I feel so cozy and comfortable in. And then like letting those worlds meet and, and, and interact and have an exchange together. And then I was like, oh, my, like the studio is my home and my home is the studio. So it was kind of like they were analogous and they um, served as a way for me to still be expressive while um, being in a space that was safe, you know, especially in the, in the middle of a, of a pandemic. Like I felt very secure with that kind of intimacy and because we worked together before I mean this was our first creation together but you know having you as a teacher at Juilliard and, and then working on Pedal and Sukio it didn't really feel like there was much of a, a difference you know that like oh we weren't in the studio it was just like oh we're working you know and we're, and we're working through ideas. Did I mean I mean obviously but I, I still want to ask it did the confined space did it, because you like figuring out your puzzle, you like puzzles, yeah. did it serve as another way, I'm using this word on purpose, did it serve as another freedom to figure out the puzzle? Or did that confinement, um, did it feel confining in, in, in kind of the, the shutdown way? Um, I would say no. <laughs> Um, I generally can always find the positive in, in any sort of situation. And I think there was something about trying to figure out how am I going to do this turn that she's asking me to do when I have a, you know, a coffee table right here and I have a TV over there. So part of me figuring out the choreography of, of home studies actually was figuring out how to work inside of this space like that then became the choreography. So I felt like they, that those two things were married and I didn't feel confined by it. So I was like, this is the space that we have and this is how, you know, the, the steps are, are, you know, you tailored the steps too that we're making this like in a smaller space too. So then part of my job was to figure out, okay, maybe if I rearrange the furniture in this way, I'll have a, a better chance at, you know, executing the choreography to the best of my ability in my living room. Um, and that to me was freeing. It didn't, it didn't feel like it was shutting me down. It actually kind of opened me up too to say, what, what opportunities do I have with what's been given to me? So I, I, have to, I have to riff on something you said because I find this very important for, um, for you know, well, if young people are watching, who knows? I don't know who watches this <laughs> But um, you said it, it's part of your job. And I think that's a, just, just to hit on this briefly, if you want to, that 
there is a collaborative, and this is how I work. And this is how, you know, my old boss worked, how many people work now, but I think sometimes it's not always taken that part of our job, I'm going to say our, because when I was a dancer, your job, when you say that was my job to figure things out, I think this is a part, I think you're a part of a new generation. Well, no, I can't even say that. I think I just need to, because every generation has known this, that is, you know, been in dance. You seem to know that part of your job is fig figuring out your solo, figuring out your dance. When I, when I watched you in Sukyo and I gave you, and Subin, when I gave you guys um, stuff to think about before the next rehearsal or in pedal, uh, when you always seem to process and come back. And I don't always know if that is, that part of the job is actually known, that that is part of the, I'm gonna say part of the great part of the job, that you, yeah. you need to be immersed in this. Can you speak to that at all? Very long-winded on my part, sorry. No, 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 it's, it's great because it's something that I, I think about quite a bit. And for me, by, by job, I mean like a responsibility to myself, a responsibility to the work, a responsibility to the people that I'm working with, and that kind of thoughtfulness is generally it it's a it's a mental thing like it's it's getting myself in the state that i need to be in to to do the choreography so a lot of times when i'm i'm going back and i'm processing a lot of it usually isn't me getting up and and, and physicalizing i like am sitting and I'm visualizing myself in the space doing it and and what it is that i'm trying to present or what it is that's being asked of me and sometimes I'll just sit in the studio I know I know that people have seen me in the studio and been like what is this guy doing but I'll just sit there kind of like zoned out but I'm just like I'm like going through the steps of like uh-huh uh-huh like I'm, I'm visualizing the dance and also still computing to the the whys of like why I'm doing that you know very very specifically like in Sukio that first hand offer, you know, like that's a moment I had to do probably more than any of the lifts, any turn, like, I mean, we just, we worked on that over and over, or, or what that first touch was like, you know, it's, it's, so it was, I had to kind of get myself into a space of being like, okay, this is, this is what, what I know that the step is, and it's, and it's, it becomes more than a step, you know, so it's, it becomes like a part of me. So how can I make something that is a step be something that is natural or something that is organic in the moment? And I think those are the things that people don't always see that dancers are, are thinking about or working on. Totally agree. And I just want to shift some semantics. Instead of natural or organic, it's what is true to you. Yeah. What is true to the individual that makes, and we all know, simplicity is harder than wild activity. Because in that simplicity, in that very, in that hand offering, we actually see the person. We see what that who, what, where, when, in that moment. Yeah. And it's remarkable that such a young person is already identifying, you know, the task of simplicity. Yeah. It can it's, take a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's- wonderful work, you know, but- Right, I mean, it's, it's kind of something too that, you know, I, I always live by with, the, with a Martha Graham quote too, and extending upon that quote, she says that a dancer's life has two fragile things, and it's simplicity and spontaneity. And I think that through that, I mean, it's from, she says this in a film called A Dancer's World, and I, I probably have watched that. There was a moment I was watching that every day, just to, to understand like what those words mean. And, and truly as an artist, what is simplicity? You know, and, and inside of that, uh, what is spontaneity? Like it's it's not just a spontaneity that comes out of mere chance or no. out of the blue. It's something with with years of experience yeah. and, and diving into 
the work and getting to like the that fine like minutia of the work and that's what's interesting to me when I'm in a choreographic process with with another creator is they you specifically have a, a very distinct way of, of of working and it's trying to get inside of what that work is while also still being true to myself. So it does, so it, it, it does take thought. When you're, when you're working with a thoughtful, especially when you're working with a thoughtful choreographer, you have to be an even more, I feel like, thoughtful dancer. Because, you know, if you kind of slack off here, choreographer's gonna go on this other worldly place and you don't wanna get left behind. That's why like in those cuddle rehearsals, I was like this, like you and Sarah in the front of the room. And I was like, every word that comes out of their mouth, I'm gonna get it. You know, <laughs> like, I'm not gonna miss anything. Cause it's like, cause the moment I look away, that may be the moment that something was said that could have changed my entire world. And I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna miss out on that opportunity. So crazy person here, crazy no, person. No, no, don't, <laughs> my call, no, don't say crazy person. It's, it, you are the stuff of what, of, of who artists are made of. What you speak of, how you, ponder how you take in how you feel about the studio you your personality is what art is made of so you you are not crazy my friend <laughs> or if you're crazy you're the crazy that needs to be there <laughs> thank you i appreciate that so <laughs> One of my favorite quotes is success favors the prepared mind as you know louis pasteur yes. but you made me actually shift it up a bit spontaneity favors the prepared mind because it's what you just said it's like spontaneity isn't just like oh inspiration came it is a lot of spontaneity happens after years months days minutes whatever you want to do of work yeah but since you mentioned that quote i'm going to jump a question and come back to it i have that in my questions so i'm just going to go there now since you okay. mentioned mark Duff. Sure. <laughs> This Martha Graham quote seems to be kind of, seems to be a mantra, of course. I'm gonna say it. And that is what you don't want to do, to fail in either clarity or in passion. Dance is communication and you want to speak clearly, beautifully, and this is what I love, inevitability. That word at the end of that quote, because you know, I've read, I mean, Martha Graham's extraordinary and she has said some of the most amazing quotes about dance, you know, and that speaks to also who she was, right? right? That's right. why she was, yeah. she was. But the last word, the inevitability, that's a shift in, a, in, 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 in how I read that quote that you have actually on your page, yes. how does this map of a quote because it really is a map, and you just spoke yeah. to, get to it, but how does this map of a quote develop for you? How does it develop for you? How do you reimagine that idea further? And how would you continue the quote? So I'm saying all the questions at once because it might. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's you kind of just hinted at it too, that it is that, that last word of inevitability. And meaning that it's it's the the purpose of what we do as artists we're doing it because it has to be done you know we're in the studio because we have to be there yeah. because because it's it's so a part of who we are and a part of the kind of change that we want to see moving forward that it it happens out of necessity and not indulgence like what we, what we do is is it's happening all because it's it's required because it's necessary. And I think that expanding upon that, honestly for me, just means that it is my responsibility to keep paying that forward, to make sure that when I'm when I'm in a space with artists that 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 kind of generosity is is almost tangible or that kind of focus is tangible because it's inevitable, because it, it has to be. There's like, there's almost no other way of us being in this space or, or being together at this time, except for the, the, the purposes of 
of showing and sharing and being generous with one another with our time and with our energy. And I'm a, I'm a really big energy person. I practice a lot of meditation. So for me, that quote kind of also translates into my meditative life of, of doing what is necessary. And, you know, the, the end of your emails always say doing what we must. I think, I think it's that same thing of like, we're, we're doing it because we have to, you know, and, and, not, and not have to in the sense of, someone's begging us to do it but oh. have to personally you know we we have to to give and we have to be a part of something almost larger than ourselves so yeah. i think it's i think it's something that has spoken to me very deeply for a, a very long time and especially when i was in college you know studying martha graham i think um uh, as a as a student, like the history and and reading about her, and then while studying the technique in my body, though when those two worlds like really came together of, of what I was reading about and the sensations I was feeling in my body, I started to understand that everything that we do in every situation that we come into contact with is some sort of conflict and conflict isn't conflict isn't always bad conflict oh, no. can just mean consideration yeah. you know it's it's the as you say it's the walk up the stairs it's the it's the offering of the hand and i think those like very small things are really really important in the big picture of of art in general yeah totally yeah, yeah so just one thing you said, we're not doing it because, not the have to isn't because someone's telling us. The have to is because we can't do anything else. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is what it is. And we yeah. have to sit in it. Yeah. We have to be in the mosh pit. And that's, it. yeah, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. I love it. Hey, you have a new choreography project you're working on. You want to speak a bit more about that? Yes, so Boston Ballet and Walnut Hill School for the Arts are collaborating for the first time this year. They're starting a year-round program for um, Boston Ballet students that will live on campus at Walnut Hill, and they'll still be able to get their school curriculum while also getting their ballet training and dance training. Uh, so the summer is kind of like the kickoff to the first year of this program. So I'm doing a choreographic residency there for three weeks and I'm choreographing on Boston Ballet 2 for the second time, or, or this is my third uh, piece for BB2. And it's, it's incredible, I think, because I've never been, besides college, I, I haven't, recently been in a space where I could just create whatever I wanted and had time and space and access to amazing dancers, you know, just at my disposal like that. And without, without the, you know, the pressures of having to produce or having to, you know, okay, the dancers, I can only have them for an hour and then they have to go to six other rehearsals. Like I can kind of just focus in. Yeah. And I think that, you know, some of my favorite choreographers, I, I can understand why now I enjoy so much of their work is because they, they have that time to just, to dive in. And, you know, I kind of was thinking yesterday, I was like, ooh, after this experience, do I really want to do anything else? I was like, because this, I've been so fulfilled and so satisfied, you know, by just having, having so much time to develop ideas and watch them unfold. Like two days ago we were rehearsing and I started choreographing something and I was like, you know, I really just don't like this. Uh, and I said, it's not you guys to tell the dancers. I was like, I said, I'm just gonna completely cut this now. I said, let's just, let's just revamp and start over. I said, cause I would rather do that than to keep going with it. And then, and then cutting like, you know, way down. Right. So I think it's just, it's a, it's a privilege and it's an incredible opportunity to be able to share this side of myself with people because a lot of people I feel like are just kind of understanding my love for choreography and they've always just seen me as, oh, Michael, 
the dancer or Michael the performer. And this, I would say choreography is a part of me in the sense that I am a lot more reserved and laid back and I'm a, I'm a watcher and a viewer. So I was like, I don't, I don't always have to be up front in doing that. Like I can, I can be in the studio, do my work and then, and then I can take a step back then. And this this program has really kind of opened my eyes in that sense of of knowing that this is possible. Like, like it, it's really possible to to be a choreographer and to to make that your career. That it's not just something like oh I'm just choreographing on the side and no like it it's something that is immersive and I really I really really like that. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but I have to say, you know, um, it took me a while to actually uh, recognize what you've already recognized. I have the three time rule now. When I have tried to rework something three times, and I'm spending a lot of time on it, and I've done my homework before, it's not just like as, you know, we've been talking about, it's not like, I come in the studio and try something. No, I mean, there's been a lot of work behind it. I've learned now to cut my losses sooner because it's like that round peg in a square. It, it's just some, it's, it, it, to recognize it's not gonna work just is such a whew, breath of freedom because you can still retrieve parts of the thing that you're throwing away and you know, make it gel in some way, you know, but yeah, that's, that's a big one. Yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let's just, let's just cut it. Let's just cut it. Let's, let's, let's try a different idea. Yes. You know, well, I also just want to say before the next question, I mean, Juilliard's a remarkable place to, to study. It really is. Yeah. I mean, the professors that are there, uh, the opportunities to discover the freedom of creation yeah. and and finding yourself. I feel I feel like that's all embedded in the ethos of of, of Juilliard. It's really I mean, having taught there a few times, it's really a remarkable place. Mm -hmm. Really yeah. remarkable. Michael, <laughs> you started your training in your hometown, Dallas, Texas. You have a degree from Juilliard. Uh, where we met, of course. You guested with several companies along the way. Uh, you joined Boston Ballet 2 in 2018, and then in 2019 in the main company. I know from our work together and knowing you a little bit, our conversations, you have many interests outside the studio, like philosophy, like critical studies. And I also have to mention you are a uh, U.S. Presidential Scholar in 2014. How do these other interests inform your dance? And then do you have plans to study further along these other avenues? And I'm sure there are more, but these are the two I picked up on. Yeah. I, it's, it's a subject I feel I find myself talking about quite a bit because if I'm not in the studio, I'm usually like in a book. Like I, I, I have books that I take with me. Like I take a book everywhere, mm -hmm. and I think that it's it opens me up as a creator to to have information. I think that information is access, and access allows you to sometimes be in places that you would have never imagined yourself being in. Yeah. And I think that that comes with the more information you know, the more information you can give. Right. And I, I really enjoy, like I said, I think it, it sparks to that curiosity that I have anyway. So I'm like, you know, I go to a bookstore and I can be in a bookstore for hours just by myself. And then I'm like, Michael, you, you need to go. Like, come on, like pick a book and, and leave. But I think that because I'm so interested in, in philosophy, and I studied philosophy while I was at Juilliard, and in and, and politics and culture and society, I think that, you know, we have this, this philosophy at Juilliard that's the artist as a citizen. And to, to be a, a citizen artist, you have to be aware of 
the world around you and you, you need to know the history in which the art that you're making or the art that you're a part of knowing its history and where it came from. And I think that when you know those things, it gives you a lot more freedom. You know, I think that, you know, they say that knowledge is power. And I think that it gives you the power to, to say the things that you want to say and to be able to articulate clearly and to, to be able to, to speak on your ideas in a way that will manifest with someone who doesn't know dance or who doesn't understand the physicality of dance. But if you can also reach them here and give them something to think about or, or, or question, you know, oh, I never thought of life in this way. I think that it's a way to, to reach all sorts of people. I was, I was in Paris a few years ago and there's this beautiful church that's on a hill. Like you, you walk up and it's, and it's this gorgeous, I mean, it's a, it's a very famous touristy church. Sorry? Sacre-Cœur? Yes, 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 yes. And I, I was in there for about an hour by myself. And I walked around maybe three times. And I was mesmerized how each time I walked around, I was picking up on something different. And I, and I cried. And I, I then tried to process. I'm like, why am I so emotional in this space? You know, not because it's, it's a particularly religious space, but because it made me realize that the reason why all of these artifacts are in here is so that anyone who comes into this building if they're, if they're blind, if they're deaf, if they have any sort of, of disadvantage, um, they can understand the message of, of what this place is, you know? So they have like the stained glass windows that have, they have pictures and, you know, things are painted on the walls. And the, the point of that is so that everyone could understand, you know, when you're in this space together, what's happening. And that's how I try to look at my art as a as a dancer communicating and as a choreographer i try to make sure that it's accessible for for everyone so that everyone is getting something out of it in a in a way that they can maybe question something about themselves or, or something about their own life and i think that that is one of the most exquisite things about what we do is that we do have that power to to reach people in, in very distinct ways. And I think that when you're studying and when you're reading and you're getting that information from, from other sources and from outside of the studio, you can't help but, but bring that in and want to share that with other people. So one thing that came up, which I agree with you on, I just, um, I believe I, say it in a slightly different way, you know, is that when I've gone to places of worship, regardless, you know, if I've been at the Wailing Wall in Israel or a church or sacrifice, you know, when I lived in Europe or, you know, or touched the wall of a synagogue or, you know, I, I mean, the, you know, I'm, I'm viewing, you know, the minarets of a beautiful mosque. These places are places of devotion. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the studio is that as well. So I believe these places of devotion, I was, I also, I, I understood the, how you got emotional because when I believe, and so you say you believe in energy. I believe energy is created, good energy is created in those creative spaces. And I believe that places of worship are also creative spaces because yeah. So much prayer is happening there, hope, wishes, you know, devotion. I feel the same way yeah. about Ballet Studio. Yeah. You know, so much energy is created there through the work, through the, I mean, it's tireless. It is an embodiment yeah. of life. And I believe that kind of devotion, there is nothing that compares. Absolutely. It's such a positive force, right? Yeah. It's, and it can be overwhelming sometimes, and a, a great overwhelm, like a great sense of, of wow, I am just this small little fraction of, of something so, so big and so monumental. And 
it really makes you sit back and say, okay, going forward, how do, how do I become a part of this history? How do I, how do I insert myself into this greatness? How, how can I be a part of, of something that is, is larger than life at times? And I think that when we, when we come together as a community, as a creative community, we have that power to, even if we don't have the answers, to, to come up with some sort of solution together and to, and to use um, everyone's gifts and everyone's talent and everyone's thought to, to be able to, to find a common ground. And, you know, that's also, that was very, I think, prevalent in home studies is that we were working virtually and we were in the same room, but we weren't in the same room. Um, and we, you know, we took the, the knowledge of, of all of your experience and we took some of my experience and we, and we found common ground. And I think that that's the only, that's the only way that it worked is that, you know, you, you compromise and you, you figure out a way to, to move forward, even when it seems like everything is against you, you know, artists, I feel like will always find a way, you know. Like we will, we will always be able to persevere and move forward because, again, it's it's inevitable. Like we we have to do it. So it's it's really special to me. And when I talk about dance, I I know that I get very philosophical with people, and I'm just like, okay, Michael, let's work on being succinct. Um, but brevity has never been my strong suit. They told me that in school. <laughs> They said, Michael, just just a little bit. Whenever I'm doing any sort of public speaking or like choreography for, for comp projects, they're like, oh, just make a little 10 second. I had a whole five minute piece. You know, I'm like, I can't, what, what, I mean, I can say something in 10 seconds, but my goodness, like, where's the development? You know? So, <laughs> like, I have a lot more than 10 seconds of experience in my, like in my personal life, you know? So, yeah. but, but yeah, it is, it's really, it's important work, I think, to, to, to reach everyone across the board. I think that's, that's the heart of what everyone is talking about now with, with equity and inclusivity right. and diversity is that everyone is being reached and everyone's needs are being met in a way that, that there's going to be an an even exchange that they feel like their needs are met and then they give something back and then and then there's always kind of like this this passing of, of frequencies or, or passing of energies and i think when you feel that like that warmth even if it's through a, a screen it, it makes you want to get up the next day and say you know helen worked me out yesterday and i'm a little sore and my back hurts <laughs> Um, and my soap gonna, is falling apart. And my soap is falling apart. But hey, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna move this furniture again, and we're gonna we're gonna do it. You know. So like that. I think the 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 satisfaction is always worth the risk. Like it's, it's always like what you're gonna get out of it is always it's worth just putting yourself out there and like just saying yes to it. Like when you ask me to do home studies, like, yes. You know, because one, I I felt like it was something that I needed for myself to, to, to stay sane and to keep going. But you never know what, what you're going to get and not getting as in like material things or, or fame, but like you, you get something so, so special and precious that you get to keep for yourself and no one can take that away from you. Like no, no, no one can take away those three weeks of home studies you know it's it's something that is a part of who I am now and a part of like my pandemic journey you know in a sense of like it kind of it was my light that at the the end of this very very dark tunnel and art can can be like that I think for everyone if we allow it to be oh um Michael I totally agree I've said it a few times now in these interviews that um great 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 life-changing art has very often come out of uh, avenues of great distress because, you know, for those of us that get to study art, and let's, let's also recognize that, yeah. we, are, we are privileged, right. right? But the thing is, is that um, once, let's say, those of us who are privileged 
enough to be in this place. Once we get over the shock of our workplaces and our work being gone for who knows how long, we get down to it. Yeah. Yeah. We get down to it. Because yeah. we have to. Yeah. Okay, the Martha Graham quote, as I said, that was the next question. We've done it. Um, okay, can you please share a favorite or another one? One, share a favorite or impactful memory from your creative life. Um, yeah, well, it's 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 a it's a thing that is a part of my creative life. I was actually telling someone yesterday that. Um, I feel like there's from my from my creative life more so for me like as a dance maker. I feel like there's always a D day in my in my choreographic process. Like there's always the Battle of Normandy at some point, you know, where it's it's a turning point, and I never know when that's gonna happen. Yeah. And I and I don't ever know how it's gonna happen. Yeah. But it it has always happened, and it and it when it does, I go whoa. Like it's it's kind of like I realized that like this has taken a, a turn for the best, um, where it just seems like all the elements come together and they just they really mesh. And I was thinking, you know, especially with the Walnut Hill residency that I'm working on, I, I felt like I I've come to the process so prepared. I mean, I have pages of notes that I've written, and I'm taking books into the studio every day with me, and I I. I've questioned, you know, in three days, I made seven minutes of material and I, I questioned, I said, did I already have the DJ? Like, has that, has that happened yet? Like, have I, have I, success, famous, prepared mine, have I prepared so much already that like, have we already meshed? Like, has it, has that already kind of, that harmony, has that happened already? And I think that's the most fulfilling and satisfying part of making dances is that that moment where you know that all this stuff has has been in your head and it just was a thought and it was an idea and then you see it executed it's it's probably like it's it's better than like ice cream or you know your favorite food like it's just you can you can taste that I feel like you can you can taste the the synchronicity of the music and the dance or the dancers and the choreography and just, and when you see it it's like okay that was it like that 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 speaks to me and that's and if it speaks to me i think it has the power to speak to other people too totally agree and i think you might find as you create more and longer pieces i think you might find there are more than one there is going to be more than one turning point yeah. Because I feel like that nexus you're speaking of, that's a kernel, yes, of all the preparation. But for example, when you, when, because I know you will, when you create your first full length, you're going to find that these points keep, you know, happening because they must, because you have, you have two hours, you know, so that, 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 um, that D-Day, as you call it, I think you're going to find that, that you'll have more times of, of like, oh, crap. And then right after the oh, crap, you'll have, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that glimmer of hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So um, do you have a daily inspiration? You spoke to meditation, so maybe that's it. Um, do you have a daily inspiration or insight that carries you through that you could perhaps share with us about being in a creative life? Something that perhaps you did speak to your optimism. So is there something specific that you might, a daily ritual? or daily thought yeah. that helps that you know someone else might might uh take on and might help them through their day yeah i i think what helps facilitate me through my day um i did mention you know meditation i, I do a lot of 
breathing and breath work uh, at multiple points in the day. But I generally, before a work day at Boston Ballet, I'll wake up at 6 a.m. and I, I do a meditation then. And I think the insight that I would give that is a really big part of, of meditation is knowing that your, your thoughts are, your mind is like the blue sky and that your thoughts are like the clouds mm -hmm. and that the clouds will pass, you know? Like the, the point of, of meditation isn't to get rid of the thought, but it's to just be able to recognize it and sit with it um, and not reinforce the thoughts, you know? There, there, there are moments throughout, um, throughout my work day where like I'm in a rehearsal, like meditating as I'm doing the movement. Or if it's a five minute break, I go to the side and I just need to close my eyes for a bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's become such a part of, of my daily practice that sometimes I don't even recognize that I'm doing it, even if I am doing it. And I think that if, if people could think of, of their mind in that way of like, it's the blue sky, let the thoughts, they'll come and go, notice them and don't judge them and just kind of let them pass. I said to the dancers a couple of days ago, uh, I was teaching class and I was giving them some, some maybe new ideas on, on you know, balancing and, and how to hold the upper body. So you guys know, know this, you know technique, you, you've been training, you've been doing this, you have great teachers, you, you know this information. I'm just maybe perhaps giving you a different way of thinking about it. I said, but in your quest to, to navigate what I am giving you, you have to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. I said, the moment when you know, you're trying something new and it's kind of not working out the way that you thought it would, I said, that's a great moment. I said, and you should pay attention to the fact that, you know, okay, I was kind of balancing like this, but I'm trying this now and it, and I'm a little like this. I said, that kind of teetering, like that conflict is a great place to be in because everything is, is starting to do this. Like the, the, the ways in which your, your brain and body are computing information, they're aligning in a different way. And I said, so when you're going through that process, you have to be kind to yourself and say, okay, I'm trying, I'm doing the best that I can. And at the end of, at the end of every day, I always tell myself, I tried my best and my best was enough. You know, it's, 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 you give all that you can give and every sacrifice is a sacrifice of a kind. It's very specific and it's very um, strong in whatever mission is trying to accomplish. And so I just give myself that. I mean, there are moments throughout the day, like I'll just be, I'll be in a rehearsal or something and I just have to rub my chest and like remind myself, like, it's okay. It's okay. Like it's, it's not, um, it's not so um, strenuous to where I have to, to, to be unkind to myself. And if I can be kind to myself, I can be kind to my partner. I can be kind to I won't allow, you know, ego and insecurity or fear and frustration cloud the, the beautiful things that are, are being offered in front of me. So I, I, I try to keep that sense of, of openness and lightness in my headspace and, and, and walk in that and, and not be afraid of what that feeling is. Beautiful. So how old are you, 85 or are you 24? 85 going on 105. Uh, <laughs> so wise, you're so wise. You're so wise for such a young person, remarkable. Last big question. In supporting and building a more equitable community, what do you believe needs to be shifted or changed? I know that I say, there's always a caveat. I always say the caveat, I know a lot does, but one thing in this interview. Something that needs to be changed. You know, I think it, it starts, honestly, with people with change. I always, I, I try to give it a simple equation, but inside of that equation, there's lots that has to be done. But I think the equation for change is thought plus logistics 
equals execution. And I think that if, if you, if it starts here, right, we have the thought of, of what, what we would like to see be different. And then you have people that can facilitate how that can happen. And then it actually happens. I, I think it really could be that simple, but I think that we have to realize that we, we need to slow down sometimes and, and have that logistical moment of being like, and I, and I feel like that's what's kind of happening in the world today is that, you know, the bot has been planted. You know, there have been many, many um, occurrences or situations that, that, that gave us that, okay, something needs to, something needs to happen. And now we're kind of doing the footwork, you know, we're like, we're at Grand Central Station right now, like trying to, trying to get there. And then I think when we, when we do get to that place, it's knowing that when you're executing, then there's another thought. So it's cyclical. It's not, it's not this um, linear trajectory. It, it kind of, it's doing this all the time. And it's something that can be, I think, a little frightening at times, but I think that nothing great has come out of complete comfort. Um, I think that everything great in life has come with some sort of discomfort, some sort of, yeah, some sort of tension or, or conflict or something. And, and if that can be our catalyst for change, that simple equation, then I think that, that it could be simple and we could actually change quite a bit. We could say, oh, I recognize what that is as what it is and I'm gonna play with some ideas and then and then I'm actually implementing. Oh, okay, I see another another issue. I recognize what that is. I'm gonna play around with some ideas, then I'm gonna do it. Uh, as opposed to maybe sometimes I think we can get stuck in, in the process. And process is great, but process without any sort of resolution is just it's just a scramble. You know, if I think we get stuck in just thinking, oh, we should change this, we should change this, and not actually like get down to the nitty gritty and like get our feet dirty. Nice. So, <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's 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 that, and that's what I've, I'm trying to do for for myself in this larger uh, idea of what's happening in the world is how how can I be the logistics person? How can I be the executor? You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm like, how can I, how can I be a part of, of, of every part of that process? You know, like, what's the, what's the best thing that I can do? So, that's 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 my, that's my insight. <laughs> well, yeah, um, that's your insight, and it's also um, a great equation to make shifts and changes uh, to make the world more equitable. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think sometimes I talked about this with uh, Teresa Ruth Howard. Sometimes I think we also might get stuck in the fact that uh, it needs time because we all know when a change, when we feel a change needs to happen, it happens as fast or as slow as you want it to happen. Yeah. So I, I, I think that equation also speaks to that, your equation. Yeah. yeah. My, my call, Michael, you know, I like to, my, you know, I love to say your name the way, uh, I love to say it. You like, you let me do that. But Michael, I'll <laughs> Michael, the other day I said, I, I quoted something and I said your name again, the Italian way, Stromile. And then I, uh -huh. was, I had to correct myself in the <laughs> He, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Why not? My call Come on. Yeah. Come on. I'm like, I'm like, that's what Helen calls me. <laughs> like I have I, I have a name for like every person I interact with. So everyone calls me something differently and I can hear it and be like, huh? What? Okay. Yeah. Like I, I I know it's me. It's so like a different dream me. cone. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I I know I know who it is. They're talking to me. I got it. <laughs> Michael, um, thank you for this incredible incredibly insightful, generous, um, thought-provoking conversation. You are, in my humble opinion, a remarkable young person, and perhaps not even young. I, I mean, you are young, but you're a remarkable person. And um, it's really, uh, it's really uh, a privilege and very exciting for me to be a part of your journey. 
because it's going to be an incredible one. So I'm really happy to start with you, you know, in, in a relatively um, new place, Juilliard, you know, start. so uh, thank you for that. Um, you have an Instagram handle. Can you say what that is or any other place where people can find out more about you? Oh, yes. My Instagram handle is at I am Callie Stro. So that's at I A M K A L Y S T R O. I don't have a website. I should have a website, but that's what we have for now. So, <laughs> hey, and perhaps a website is coming in the near future. Perhaps. <laughs> Um, if you wouldn't mind staying with me while I finish up the show and then we'll say our goodbyes. Um, so there are two new sessions every week, Tuesdays and uh, Sundays, and you'll find that on the Creative Vitality Jam Session YouTube channel. And this interview will be posted in a few hours and with the interview comes the description box and you will see a short bio from Michael. Um, and again, if you want to find out more about him, you can also, oh, this is also true, Michael. We could go to the Boston Ballet website because there they'll find out more about you as well. Perhaps see some pictures of you. Um, so, and then our next session, we're going to have a soloist from the Scottish Ballet, Araminta Wraith, that is on Tuesday. And I want to say my thank yous now, uh, Gracie Spina, the intern co-producer extraordinaire who makes this uh, interviews, these interviews happen twice a week. Thank you so much, Gracie. Thank you to my um, amazing dance world that I'm a part of, grateful every day to be a part of you. My call, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, great seeing you again, I miss you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And so keep reimagining creativity. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.